Human Metascope in May. We are already in May and today it's a really nice summer day here in Italy. I'm Heidi and everything is fine at the moment. I was uh, cutting grass quite a bit and now I'm a little tired but anyway. I give over to Martini. She was the first one here in the room. Hello, all of you. I am from Kritzendorf, close to Vienna. And uh, we have a beautiful day, like all of you. And our um, Pfingstrosen, how do you call them, are so... Ionia, is, I think it's the... Uh, the, the they are so beautiful <laughs> and a lot of um, uh, green uh, kefirs uh, in them and a lot of uh, bees. I saw uh, uh, bienen, bienen. Bees. Bees, yeah. It's really beautiful. And I was already swimming today. And um, it has um, uh, 14 degrees. <laughs> I give over to Mo. Peony. Peony. Uh, oh, peony. Yeah. Well, we almost, yeah, we have 30 degrees. So swimming in 14 degrees water doesn't impress me as much, but I wouldn't, no, you can't get me there. Uh, Vienna is now a Baroque city. Lilacs blooming everywhere. Wherever you turn a corner, there is lilacs and it's just beautiful. So this is now the Baroque time of Vienna. Blue skies, sunshine. It will be colder again in a couple of days, but right now we have summer. And I give over to Gertraud. Actually, we do have the weather that you get <laughs> in a couple of days, rainy, not too cold. So it, it went down a bit, but not that as cold as it was. So I'm in Germany, <laughs> north of Frankfurt, and uh, we sent the weather to Austria two, three days after. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and today I did a very I did two big tasks. One is with wild, what is it called? Wild garlic pesto. And the other one was for my pension to get all this. You sent them something and then they come back to you and said, yes, but now we need this <laughs> and this form and you didn't do this one. And uh, yeah, so, so it's a never ending story and I hope it ends pretty soon. So today I had, I hope, <laughs> the last form to fill out. And it could be that it's four months uh, that they that they will come back to me. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm fine. Uh, just achieved today, and I hand over to Christine. Good morning. I am in Carlsbad, California, which is Southern California. Um, yesterday was Mother's Day in the States. So that was, it's always a very nice uh, weekend for moms. And uh, I have a tradition in the family that um, I make everybody go play miniature golf, uh, which I don't know if you have that in Europe. Do you have miniature golf in Europe? Yeah. So I like it because I always win. So <laughs> it's fun for me. And my husband gets so competitive and frustrated that, you know, he hasn't been able to beat me over all these years. I don't even know why I can do it. I have no idea. It's like one of the few sporty things that uh, I have some uh, proclivity for. So it was fun. Um, got some ice cream afterward. Uh, and I think the biggest thing uh, is that my younger daughter, Alexis, uh, she is 23 and she is in the process of moving out uh, her own apartment for the first time. So that is bittersweet. Uh, she's so happy 
to be doing that after spending, you know, she graduated college a year ago, she's been working, saving money, and she's become increasingly depressed by uh, living with her, living at home and having her life on hold, kind of waiting to get her life started. So there's been a dramatic improvement in her mood. So that's been wonderful to see. But of course, it means the end of an era uh, for Tom and I to realize our kids are both now out of the nest, fully out of the nest. And um, you can't roll that backward, it can only go forward. So trying to embrace that, but uh, it's been fun to see her excitement and we're helping her with the process uh, of moving and stuff like that. So that's been taking up a lot of our time in the past couple of weeks. And I will pass to Victoria. Good morning, everyone. I can't, um, I guess I can't excuse myself for being groggy because <laughs> Christine is so lively <laughs> after her wonderful Mother's Day. That sounds so great. Um, I wanted to ask you, sorry, everybody, I just have to ask this question. Did you have ice cream at Handel's by any chance? I think so. The place um, on Coast Highway in Encinitas? Yes. yes. 50 flavors. 50 flavors. Yes. I couldn't make up my mind. It was good. Oh, that's my favorite place on earth. What, what yeah. flavor did you have? I got blueberry cobbler. Ooh. And I asked for one scoop and I got like this much ice cream. I couldn't believe it. It was like, so it was good. So you haven't been there before. Wow. Well, Mother's Day, what a great day to do it. I, I make pilgrimages yeah. up there to go <laughs> to go there. I, I can see been, why. Yeah. I haven't been there since the pandemic. But anyway, sorry, everybody. <laughs> if you come to California, go to Handel's. <laughs> um, apparently, they, it's, it's homemade ice cream and they make it fresh every day. I don't know what they they're very religious about. They might even throw out the ice cream they don't sell. I don't know. It's it's um, they're very um, it's fabulous. Anyway, some housewife in Indiana apparently just started making it in 1947 or something, and they've been making it ever since. Anyway, sorry about that. that that's the big news of the day. <laughs> um, yes, happy happy um, Mother's Day to everyone here. Um, Beatrice and I are wearing our mother-daughter dress, zebra dresses, um, <laughs> which we've had for a few years actually. Um, but I had a wonderful Mother's Day. Oh, maybe I can, let me see. I don't, I'm not good at this. But um, anyway, I, I, I have a whole display here of my Mother's Day gifts, um, but miniature golf sounds fabulous. Um, I hope to do that again soon. Um, so we, it was hard to be without Beatrice. And um, so I empathize with uh, Christine losing your daughter, but you're lucky to have her so long. Beatrice got out of the nest almost before she could fly. Um, so so uh, I've, she's been away for a long time, but um, yeah, it's so great to have your children nearby. And um, so Beatrice and I are together in spirit. And, um, <laughs> um, and I just finished a humongous retreat on conflict resolution, which I went to by mistake um, instead of working on my voice lectures. And the only thing that came out of the three day retreat, which was seven hours a day was that I had a conflict with the teacher and the moderator of the, <laughs> the moderator of the retreat, um, who, you know, who was in charge for all, of all the technology was so horrified. That they, he put the teacher and me in a, in a private breakout group after a uh, breakout room after the session on Saturday. <laughs> so it was a, um, anyway, that was, I'm exhausted from the whole thing. And um, it was very strange, but, um, but Mother's Day was great. Thanks to Beatrice who sent a lot of things. Um, I'm going to try to at least share the flowers with you. And um, what else? Uh, tomorrow start, I start my Boyce lecture series. And so I'm really excited, but it's also, I'm getting emails now on a daily basis from people that I know and some people that I don't know who heard about it from people that I know, all telling me um, how they met Boyce at Documenta in 1978 or whatever. And 
And one of my friends said, oh yes, I met him many times. I reviewed his shows in New York for Art News. And somebody else wrote and said, oh yes, I did a work based on boys. <laughs> so now of course I'm terrified because like all these specialists, because they all, they all signed up for my series. So, um, so I ha as usual, I have to bluff my way through. And um, it's, so it's kind of exciting, but terrifying. It's sort of like, I'm about to like, do you know downhill skiing on Mount Everest and I've never had skis on so we'll see how it goes <laughs> but um, at least I won't get stuck in a breakout room for conflict <laughs> hopefully um, okay I'm talking way too much sorry it's eyes early in the morning I get to motor mouth um, did everyone share no Beatrice didn't share um, I think everyone else did Oh, and weather, everyone's talking about the weather. It's very bleak here, um, June gloom in May. Is that true for you, Christine? Yeah, it's foggy and cold, but I like that. It makes me um, more alert for some reason. Okay, sorry for the long, I won't talk anymore. Beatrice, I pass to you, my little child. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm in New York, it is, it's been kind of on the chillier side, but sunny and nice. It's definitely springtime here, passing along the, the weather <laughs> thread. Um, what do I have going on? I, I have a friend coming from Ohio um, who I haven't seen in over a year, but we're both vaccinated now. So we get to visit with each other and he's gonna stay for a week. So he's arriving in about five hours, four hours or so. Um, so that's exciting. And then part of what's fun about having someone visiting is then I get to do all the touristy things that I don't do when I am here, just living here. So I'm going up to, on Thursday, going up to a place called Storm King, which is this giant, giant outdoor um, sculpture museum garden. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's like hundreds and hundreds of acres, really, really huge. And it's all these like massive sculptures, contemporary sculptures um, by really famous artists. Um, and it's a fun place to kind of hike around and see art and still be outside, um, which it's the nice weather for. And I also am not very comfortable with doing indoor things yet, um, even though things are opening up. Um, so that's exciting. I'm excited for my week. Um, and what else? Um, so I've just been, I've been cleaning my apartment, <laughs> take someone visiting to <laughs> actually get around to cleaning my apartment. Um, but it's as clean as it's been in a very long time, <laughs> um, which is nice. And, um, and then the, the foundation that I've been working for with, with our family friend, um, we're, we're going to get, try to get incorporated really soon. And um, it looks like we're going to team up with another gallery to get a, a space for um, kind of a permanent residency um, with this other gallery and show uh, Ken's work, which, which is the artist that we've been, Matt's partner, Ken, who is the painter that we've been, the whole foundation is all about. Um, so that's exciting. So probably starting maybe like next week, I might even have an, an office to go to or we'll see how things go. Um, so things are things are in the works, and I think those are all my updates. Oh, and I've been um, many people in this room will be delighted to hear. Uh, after last week's German meeting, I uh, re-downloaded my Duolingo language app, and have been doing daily German practice. So um, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully my German will get better and better, and I'll I'll be able to speak in German to the group. Um, so those are my updates. And I guess I send it back to Heidi because I think everyone has spoken. Thank you. So we didn't have um, thought about a topic, but what I'm hearing today is life changes seem to be around for, for many of us. You know, I hear Christine say that the daughter goes away. Beatrice starts with her new uh, foundation thing, you know, and uh, tries to get uh, into a new life and um, somebody else, I, I forgot who it was, talked about these changing moments in our lives. So we might talk about that. Uh, when it's at the moment, it's fine. Uh, even if it's in the past, that's fine too. So if you are okay with that. Uh, what I really would like to hear more about 
Miss Victoria's conflict resolution. What did you learn there? That's also changing you... moments. <laughs> okay. I, I could talk for three days. I spent I spent over 20 hours in that in that in that thing. Um well, I sure I can. I mean, I can bring up the topic, and um, all of you can then talk about how you resolve conflicts. Um, boy, that's putting me on the spot because I uh, <laughs> um, the yeah, the, it, it was interesting because it was a Buddhist. Um, the the reason I signed up for it was it was um, it was a Buddhist conference uh, retreat. Uh, by Spirit Rock, which is um, is a I guess it's a, I mean I don't guess it's a real place in Northern California, but but it, I've never been there. I just heard about Spirit Rock through the pandemic, and I've been going to their uh, a lot of their um, meditation days. And my favorite teacher, or so I thought he was, until we had our conflict, <laughs> um, was offering the retreat. So I was all excited because I really until Saturday I really loved him. I thought he was great. And um, he's very erudite. He, actually, all of you might be interested in knowing his name is Donald Rothberg. And he, um, way back, I'm not sure how long ago, but a long time ago, he um, had the idea of a book um, on um, Ken Wilber's ideas as mediated by different people, different people in the um, sort of the whatever, transpersonal, intellectual, spiritual, whatever world. I don't know the book, so that's why I'm talking so vaguely, but maybe if you look up his name, um, as far as I, Donald Rothberg, R -O, well, I can send it to you too, or I'll put it in the chat, or Beatrice can put it in the chat. Well, so there, Ken Wilber comes in, great. So Ken Wilber comes in, which is great actually, because, um, yeah, because he's mentioned Ken Wilber a number of times, and I don't know what, I don't know the backstory of the book, but, but when he, um, talked to me about it. He just said that it, he thinks it's, he really thinks it's a good book and very, and an important book, but apparently, and he didn't tell me why he said he had been very close friends with Ken Wilbur before he did the book. That's why he did it. But he said it ended their friendship. So I, if that's like a mystery that I don't know, he didn't say whether it was something, but maybe now that I've had a conflict resolution with him, maybe, <laughs> well, maybe. maybe he needs conflict resolution. Yeah. <laughs> So what so, was your conflict with him? Um, well, it was it was very silly actually, but he made such a big deal about. It. I guess he's he's so um, he's so profoundly committed to the idea of um, you know like living out the the Dharma or whatever, and that he um, he he. I mean, that, uh, to me, it, it was so embarrassing that then I I couldn't appear on screen for the next two days. I was too embarrassed. Um, it was basically that I guess he kind of knows me and um, and in his, um, well, I won't get into the details because we don't have enough time, but essentially what it was, was that um, he was always, you know, when he would talk, then he, of course, because it was, a, it was interactive, he would ask the retreatants if we had questions or if we had reactions or comments to the material that had just been presented. So um, all of you know me by now too. So I would raise my hand after every <laughs> everything he did because I, I always had a reaction because I you know I love to discuss things with people. So um, at one point, but I'm also sensitive to other people. I hope, but maybe you maybe you <laughs> agree with I don't know. Um, so at one point, nobody came forward. It was the beginning of the retreat, and I think people were really shy um, and. So I waited for a while and still no one raised their hand. And he looked, and Donald, the teacher looked very kind of forlorn. And he said, he said, well, you know, doesn't anyone have any questions or reactions? So I raised my hand again and, and he, it, I had scarcely like put my hand up like this. And he said, oh, Victoria, in front of this big gr group of strangers. Um, well, we've already heard quite a bit out of you. So, um, you know, I'd like to hear from somebody else. And I, my immediate reaction, and here I was on screen, you know, with all these strangers, and I went like this, because I felt suddenly like I was thrown back into the first grade, and this was my teacher, and I was like a five-year-old. And so, um, 
So I didn't respond to him at all. I, I mean, I, that was it. I was rebuked and I, I never raised my hand again. But I wrote to the moderator in the chat about something about, I can't remember why. And, um, and he wrote back and he said, um, oh, I, somehow I missed that. He said, um, this is supposed to be a safe learning environment. And so then I didn't hear anything. And then at the end of the day, the moderator wrote to me in the chat and said, would you be willing to meet in a private breakout group room after the retreat? Donald wants to apologize. So on the one hand, I was, well, I was embarrassed that the moderator shared this whole thing with, with Donald. I didn't know he was going to do that. Um, and I didn't want to do it, but he, the moderators sort of begged me to, because they're, I guess it's just, they're very ethical and Spirit Rock is a big organization. And I think they really, you know, care deeply about their programs. So I did it out of respect basically. And, um, and then, and then it was just talking about, you know, people's boundaries and things like that. So it wasn't a big deal. The, the, the retreat on the other hand, like the, it, it escalated it, it, um, not the conflict, <laughs> the subject matter. So it started with what I thought it was all going to be about, which was more about um, interior. So it's this inner and ex inner internal and external conflicts, because we can have internal conflicts. Um, you know, so, so in the beginning, it was working with the basic principles of how to resolve, um, you know, conflicts of any kind, whether they're internal or external. And that was more sort of what I thought it was going to be about. But then as the retreat progressed, it increased. So then it moved out. Um, well, kind of like for those of you who know the, the metta practice in Buddhism, which is like um, you show compassion for yourself, then um, for, for a close like family member or friend, someone that is very close to you. And then you expand to, um, to, uh, there, then there's the the, the so-called patron, which means I guess somebody that you feel like a mentor or something like that. And then I mean I guess there are different patterns. And then there's um, then you do it like a stranger, like the person that cuts your hair. Oh, I like your haircut, Monia. Um, <laughs> so you would, that would be so that's the point. Or it's, sometimes they use that first if if it's triggering to be able to think of these people. You'll start with someone that that you someone you know, but you, you don't have any emotional. Uh, charges one way or another, positive or negative. And then you move out to, um, uh, then only then when you're kind of into the practice and you're sort of filled with loving kindness and compassion, do you try to, uh, to think about the people that you actually have conflicts with? Um, and then, well, and then anyway, in the normal practice, it's, it's not about conflicts, it's just about compassion. And then you, you expand to all beings, you know, you know, from, you know, microbes to megaliths or whatever. Um, so, but in this case, we moved gradually. That that was interesting to, we, there were role plays and things. So there were, you know, it, so it was introducing, it was, it's like a muscle apparently, that's the way he thinks of it. It's like, a, it's a skill that you work, work up to things. So, so you start with either imaginary conflicts or, or conflicts that are very minor, like two children wanting, both wanting the to eat an orange or something. What does the mother do? You know, sort of that kind of thing, just to get the skills working. And only only when you're secure in that do you approach the big things. Because like on the on the last day, we saw a video about um, the early civil rights movement in America, and um, the this pastor um, James Lawson, who was the person that. Um, that actually started, I didn't even know this. I always thought it was like Martin Luther King, but this is before Martin Luther King. Um, not, not before, but well, anyway, um, this James Lawson um, developed a very, very st strict model for how to organize the nonviolent um, demonstrations. And so it was to have a very secure container in which to do this, um, so that it wasn't just chaos and wouldn't erupt into more conflict. So I thought that in itself was fascinating. So it was this really amazing. Um, yeah, if, when I get the link for the film, cause I didn't, they just showed it at the retreat. Um, I, I, might, I might send you some of this material if you're interested because the film was really gut wrenching. I mean, it was actual footage from the 
you know, the demonstrations in the, in the lunch counters in Nashville. Um, but what I learned from all of that, so, so anyway, it got into um, social activism at the end of the retreat. That's what we were talking about then. So, you know, like in America right now, the Black Lives Matter movement and things like that. So it moved, it moved into the really big issues and how, you know, what are the best approaches for um, dealing with that kind of conflict. So, so it went from the micro, um, you know, like, and the internal, of course, is any kind of decision making is a big part of it, I guess, when you, you're in conflict with yourself, you want two things at the same time. So there was, there was kind of, he did a lot of things with graphs, but I don't want to, um, maybe I should, you know, you probably want to maybe bring up your own conflict issues because I, I don't want to pontificate. <laughs> I'm wondering where we go from here. You, you explained a lot about this. Monia was asking what was your conflict, uh, actually, which you had with a, with a teacher. I, so I understood that. Oh. Yeah, but she mentioned it. She said that he refused her. <laughs> like a child. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I wonder where we go from here. Well, I, I am familiar with the Buddhist approach to conflict resolution. But actually, you were talking about the loving kindness and compassion meditation, so the heart meditation. And of course, this is a very advanced practice. And you shouldn't start it too early to give your love and your compassion to people you really don't like, because this is really difficult. It's uh, that's what I learned about that, or I heard about it, because you have to be rather uh, well. I, w I don't want to say advanced, but you in your practice, you have to have a lot of practice and skill to do that. That you, it's easier to just channel good thoughts to others, but to transform it in yourself and, and give compassion to others, it is difficult. So this read needs a lot of skill. Well, what's, oh, sorry. What's interesting, oh. um, and this could be a theme that I think we could talk about, but well, I could talk, not talk about, I could, I'd like to learn about it. Um, what apparently, um, they've noticed, which is really interesting, I mean, in general, in the community, in the international community, is that the most difficult self-compassion, uh, the most difficult is self-compassion, that our, our society has made this dramatic shift with, um, I, and I don't know what's behind it, but um, may, maybe it was always like that and it wasn't acknowledged. That's that's a, probably what it was, um, but that, that were conditioned with so much, um, you know, self-judgment and self-criticism, and you know, even self-hatred. And so, so now with the meta practice, which is you know, whatever, twenty five hundred years old, <laughs> they they are they ha change the sequence often. It depends, you know, it depends. It's it's you know, you can do what you want with it. But um, I have found personally, it's really strange. I'm still, because of my trauma, I'm still battling the most with self-compassion. And strangely enough, even my opponents, like my sister, who's my one major living opponent right now, um, as I've learned about these um, values and really immersed myself in them, I feel tremendous compassion towards her, but I still can't you know, she's not doing the work on her side, so we can't communicate. But I, I'm, I've now seen her through this compassionate lens. So, so that's something I think that we could talk about is how, um, yeah, how, how we, where we feel it easier, or more, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's your fault, Monia. You brought me no, into this. Fin finish that <laughs> sentence. Where we feel it, where it's easiest to love ourselves, maybe. Yeah, or 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 what what is it that um, you know, or or which aspect of compassion is easiest? You know, I think for some of the some of the people who are really involved in um, social activism, mm -hmm. and I know some people. I have a, I have a friend who's very very involved and very dedicated, and very gives time and money and energy to all kinds of causes. But as a as a human being, like seeing her with her own son, for example, she's very harsh and doesn't seem compassionate at all. 
And yet for these causes, she'll lay down her life. So that's interesting. You know, so I think all of us maybe have certain affinities. In well, what comes of- now right to my mind is Jordan Peterson and his 12 rules. Do you, have you read it, the book, or heard it? This is also an, an audit. An, 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 an 12 book. Rules for Life in Chaos. And um, because uh, he, yeah, this is, this is essential that when you, when you are not able to tidy up your own room, so it's like Beatrice did, so it's now... <laughs> Uh, you are not able to to save the world. Mm-hmm. And I found this a very, very... Uh, so his rules are rather basic, something our generation learned a long time ago. But this generation hasn't learned it yet. And they always go out to save the world. But if you look around, if they look around in their own room, it's just chaos. So how to get structure in your life and uh, I, I guess you know that Heidi and I am very, we appreciate Jordan Peterson a lot because he's really a clear thinker and uh, you can watch him on YouTube. And, uh, and now he wrote the, the last book that he just wrote is Beyond, uh, where he talks about his own suffering and the, the, the situations he had to face while going on tour and having talks and at home his wife was very very sick and so he is a very feminine man he's emotional he stands and he really uh, stands to, uh, he doesn't shrink back from emotions um we just started that book and uh, we maybe we are going to read it in our reading circle because I'm now going to establish another reading circle because I don't have one. And if there's something missing in my life, I just create it. And uh, yeah. I would like to open the discussion a little bit to the other people who are only listening. (laughs) I had a question, Monia. Are we ever really done cleaning up our room? You know, at what point would you say, yes, I've done enough and now I can focus on my wider circle. I, I don't know that you ever, I don't know, I don't know that I ever get to the point where I would say, okay, I've done enough on me and now I'm ready. That, that is a question I would have about that approach. I would say that's not uh, first do this and then to the other. But it, as, as Victoria said, when, when you are in one situation, pretend to save the world, but in your own private situation is, is total chaos. I always say, said it differently. When in your own intimate relationship, you cannot find peace, how would you think that in the world would be peace? You know, that's more or less the, the, the same thing. So that we really have to start at the at the beginning, <laughs> and that's with ourselves. And as Victoria said, if you can't love yourself, how can you love anybody else? That's so. It's not so much sequential; it's more simultaneous. You have to address them. You have to address them simultaneously, not necessarily sequentially. Well, we ju- because the weather is so hot, I just had all my summer clothes d- down for. <laughs> Now it's, the room is full of boxes and I just don't want to go in. So it's chaos in there. But this is why I come here because here is everything <laughs> settled and clear. Okay. Did this answer your question, Christine? So it's- I think so, I think yeah. so. Good. So let's hear from the others. What would you like to add or to bring forth? Or today we have no uh, topic central topic so what is coming up for you it's okay i do hear quite a bit of dualism and the dualism we have to at least i try this uh, for myself to handle this insight that if I uh, get and find in front of me or myself, 
then I just watch at it. And, and if I can um, uh, um, conclusion, um, if I can solve, solve the dualities between uh, in, 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 the, in the present, uh, then it helps me very much. Um, and by the way, I can, um, I do need a lot of chaos around me because if I am working, I create chaos. Like what you said, Monia, you are uh, looking at your uh, clothes, summer clothes, and then you get all, and you do, oh, you get all the, the um, chaos, yeah? But it is a necessity uh, to uh, have the chaos in order to become again um, familiar with, this is what I want. And, and uh, why, why do we are scared for uh, the chaos? Uh, I think it is a, uh, I, I think it is a very, um, uh, helpful thing to get the chaos in order to, to clean up again what you did, um, Beatrice, and you feel very fine, but how it, it happens again that it, the chaos is there as well, and also with the friends and the people I can love, and it is so hard to be in into contact with people I don't like at all. But this is our challenge uh, that, to, to um, it is a gift. Um, my husband has worked on a system like uh, if there is no problem anymore, this is in, in Japanese system to, uh, uh, to uh, better the things, to um, improve things. If there are no problems, you are not learning. You are not, um, uh, be because you have to use your creativity to handle this. Um, uh, I have a lot of problems and a lot of chaos. And I'm happy. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, have a, I'm suspicious now because usually I try to do this within two hours, changing the seasonal clothing. But now today I just leave it there and I look at everything and I wonder, can I leave that, can I drop that, which will I keep and what will I keep? And it's, uh, yeah, I sort of enjoy the cars maybe too. <laughs> Because it's, that's, uh, yeah, I, I just like to have my order back rather soon. But now I leave it there and so I just move around the boxes and <laughs> see what happens. Well, I think Martini's point, it, 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 you're exemplifying that, Monia, because you're almost creating a new wardrobe rather than just replacing one for one you're thinking about it and deciding and, you know, figuring out really what's best. So you're creating something new, not the same. Yep. But you have to iron it and oh God. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. For me, it was really relieving to listen to Martini uh, because, um, I haven't read that book, but I've uh, heard about the 12 rules and I have my mom in my ears. Um, you will never get anywhere if you're not tidy enough. And there is such a load of should behind it and moral impetus that I'm not sure who invented that, that we must not have cows around us 
Um, I think okay. it's better. I would like, I would like to be more tidy. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes it's really relieving. But um, for example, I, I have a special meditation, it's called Ishaya's Ascension. And I, the first time the, the teachers came over, I was at the airport and they were late. And so I was sitting down in the biggest cows, everybody coming in and out and uh, planes leaving and whatever. And I was sitting there in the, in the accepting um, hall. And then I got a phone call and said, where are you? And said, I'm, I'm, I'm right here. So, um, and they passed by because I was so <laughs> relaxed. and <laughs> They didn't think I was waiting for anybody. So I, I have that ability. And my, my husband, when he was in, in uh, Bangladesh, in, in Nepal and so on, he said, ultimate chaos, <laughs> but people just, yeah, they, they can be relaxed with it. And, and it's not that I don't prefer to be tidy or, uh, but to, to say, then you can't do anything else because you are this type of a person that really like hold, held me hostage <laughs> in a way. Um, and I decided, not to believe it just just to be free to to do what what I need to do and I want to do it and it doesn't mean that I say there is no correlation at all but uh, but have it as a moral, moral impetus and and if you don't do that you will never <laughs> I don't accept that well, and thank you Martini for <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a misunderstanding. It's not about you have to be uh, in order all the time. What Stuart Peterson says is order and chaos is uh, uh, conditioning each other. Yeah, when the order is too much, you need chaos. And out of the chaos, you need to create new order, which works for a while, and then it's too much, and then it's, it's, a, it's always a cycle. Mm -hmm. But uh, what Monia was saying is when you are not able to have a structure, then it's difficult to um, to teach other people or, or the world or whoever to have a structure. And in integral terms, if you haven't had a good blue um, uh, yeah. socialization, then it's difficult because it, you are missing the boundaries. You are missing the 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 safe haven, let's say. You know, because you have not just explain. Blue means conservative structures, uh, hierarchies. So what a child learns when it yeah. has to follow certain rules, right. you know, when it's you never have had right to, or, yeah. mm -hmm. if, if you yeah, never if... have learned these rules, then uh, later in life, it will be difficult because you don't know, you, you need to learn the rules for learning them and then to transcend them, you know, and then later to decide, oh, this rule, yeah, it was useful when I was a child, but now it's not. But if you never had this sort of he calls it fenced garden where you are safe, which you can explore safely, then you are always somewhere and don't know who you are and where you are. And I Elsa, have, I think I that's, have... that's her name. She, she said that um, you cannot have a state like Somalia or so without that blue quality. So I that's the basis. I have to say goodbye because I have another Zoom <laughs> meeting. <laughs> Uh, 10 o'clock, I don't know. Busy lady. But have a good time, all of you. It's been great seeing all of you and hearing all of you. Let's see what uh, Beatrice can say. She didn't open mouth because she is so impressed that she has tidied up her room. <laughs> no, I've already had so much to say. Oh, I've had thoughts along the way. Um, I mean, I was going to say, what Heidi, what you just said about the ebb and flow of chaos. And I mean, for me, that's true. Even, even with literal tidying up, it's 
the chaos is fine for, at least for me, the chaos is fine for a while and then it, it reaches a breaking point. And then suddenly everything has to be dealt with and cleaned up and organized and put away. And then, and then that's a really lovely place. And then life happens and it becomes, you know, it's, it is that cycle. Um, and then I wanted to respond to Gertrude's thought about, I mean, I thought about what it means to live in the city, living in New York. One of the things you have to learn how to do is to find grounding and relaxation in the midst of constant chaos. It's, I mean, I live in Brooklyn, which is much like, I live in a more residential, quieter place, um, which is very, in my mind, very helpful <laughs> to, to um, but when I lived in Manhattan for a while, I was right in the middle of the city, you know, and I could hear the traffic outside my window at, at all hours of the day, um, even, you know, really early morning hours and people yelling and music playing and, you know, all kinds, and then you walk out the door and people everywhere. And and when I wasn't figuring out how to ground myself within that, I was falling apart because it was just chipping away at me. Um, so I think that is very important to, to be able to find grounding within chaos. But I don't think the relaxation that you find, I mean, I guess it depends on how, your, how advanced your practice is, as Monia would say. I, the peace that you can find within a chaotic environment, I'm not sure. I think the peace that you find in a peaceful environment is deeper, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like I imagine, you know, like finding grounding within the city or within the airport or whatever. And if you can really be there, that's amazing, an amazing feeling and it all washes over you. But if you compare that to sitting, you know, in an empty forest or field or even somewhere in nature and there's no nothing around except for nature and nature sounds <laughs> I prefer this one <laughs> I I prefer I prefer the the peaceful piece um and the same is true you know if if your if your mind is chaos you know if you have a thousand things on your to-do list or you're behind on a lot of things or worrying about a lot of things or people it's of course it's important to be able to find peace and meditation and grounding in that context too. It's the only way to kind of go through it. But it's different than when you're actually on vacation, you're actually taking a break, or you know, you finished all of your tasks at the end of the day and then can relax. So I don't know, those were the things I was thinking about of, of the, the types of rest and grounding and relaxation you can achieve. I wouldn't argue that. I was just at this this moral impetus. <laughs> Unless you don't have that external whatever, then you cannot. So that's that's what I want to. But I don't argue what you just said. I I keep coming back to the point that uh, Martini made of of how how the chaos is useful. And it seems like we're really delving into philosophy today in some way, because I think we're talking about what it means to be a human being and new things keep emerging. You know, change is just a part of what we have to get used to and experience as humans. Um, and both spiritual teachings as well as philosophical teachings tell us that there's order, disorder, and reorder. Or Hegel would say thesis, antithesis, synthesis. There's always this continuous cycle and we really don't get to stop being <laughs> in the cycle depending on where we are at any particular time, but it, it's just an ongoing cycle of things are gonna continue to emerge in our lives. And of course we want them to continue while well, most of us want them to continue emerging and not be static. Um, so Martini's point about the usefulness of that, I think has been you know, reaffirmed continually by spiritual leaders, ph philosophers. I don't know what, uh, I'm trying to think what Wilbur specifically might say about that, but nothing comes to mind. Well, in my, my thesis about 
grief and death. That was, that was basically my argument that there's way too much pressure and structure around what it's supposed to look like to grieve and what is it supposed to look like to have a good death and how are all these things are supposed to be very organized and structured and, you know, <laughs> happen a certain way. And the reality of life and humanity is it doesn't happen that way. And it's messy and it's complicated and it's unique and individual. And it's, you know, there, there are challenges that come up and there are messes that come up and chaos and order and everything. You have to make your own order out of it and your own sense out of it. And the more we can embrace that cycle and that kind of ebb and flow of what it means to be human, the better off we are and the more healthy we are. And the, I think ultimately the happier we are um, rather than trying to stick everything into very confined boxes and containers. I do feel that I cannot change anything and I do not need to change myself. I just have to be myself. And this peace within and this dying within at the moment, all the time I have to die, to die for the um, duality in front of me. What do I do? Do I draw this beautiful flower, what I love to draw, or uh, do I have to cook? <laughs> or, uh, uh, I am at home, My, um, like everybody has their home office now at home, and I had my studio at home, so I am going down to wash my paint, uh, my paintbrush, and then I see that that flower doesn't have water, oh, I'm going to give the flower water, so, um, you know, um, uh, what are we doing? Uh, what is in front of me. We had a little bit of, of um, um, in the spiritual uh, uh, practice, one says, whatever you have in front of you, this is the most important uh, uh, person or thing or whatever. So we have to be awake all the time or I'm dying. And and I I cannot change my husband. I cannot change my children. I I cannot change. I I didn't do anything by teaching drawing. I was just silent, and I hoped that everybody gets out of what is in there in in themselves. And I was praying for them, but I was silent. I was just silent. I gave them the instruction and I didn't say anything. And the things happened. So I, I do not think that we are, um, that it is our job to change the world. I'm very pleased. I, I'm just thinking of a friend who who separated from a, from her boyfriend uh, because he was such an what did she said um, uh, freedom warrior <laughs> so he was always fighting for freedom and uh, so it was like unpleasant to be around and um, I, I'm I'm thinking of. Uh, what Victoria said, so we are, don't have self-compassion. I think that self-compassion comes through seeing what's so. So what I'm complaining about or what do I treat myself, how do I treat myself or things like that. And then self-pity <laughs> to really like maybe turning on the volume, say, oh my, or oh, I'm such a poor, I'm, I'm so yeah, just to have pity for myself. And then I think compassion, you cannot just make it. You, there is something you first have to go through. 
to to acknowledge where you are at so not not to jump over it and then say oh sentences like i love myself exactly how i am <laughs> it doesn't really help <laughs> yeah so so i think that's yeah acknowledging and um self-pity sounds so bad and shouldn't do but sometimes i really need it i really need to to yeah be complaining and Yeah, <laughs> feel so, <laughs> so <laughs> human. Yeah, Victoria. And then sometimes I have to laugh, and <laughs> then then this opens up in a new way. Victoria, I was wondering if you came away from your conference, if there was a takeaway in terms of what you wanted to focus on for yourself. Like, was there a, a personal piece of what? it said i'm going to work on this or if if the retreat itself was supposed to convey a, a motivation to do anything in particular well actually you sound just like um donald rothberg <laughs> that, that was his last the last thing he said um no unfortunately um for me it ended up just a a kind of a um maybe, maybe there will be fruits in time but but the uh, apropos of self-compassion, unfortunately, uh, I realized in this whole event and experience that um, that I'm far from enlightened <laughs> or healed or however you want to say it, because um, just this this encounter with with him was so demoralizing for me that even though we had the conversation, to me it made it 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 outlined it even more and made it so i i was un, literally unable the only i could only participate after that um in the breakout groups of which we had a lot because we were doing role playing and things so with the other participants in the retreat i i had a great time um because i was i was comfortable but but in the big group i sort of went into my shell and strangely enough um that was one of the topics was about how um, if we, if we're conflict avoidant, we often, um, you know, we distance ourselves, but by distancing ourselves, we actually increase the perceived conflict. And that's exactly what I did. Um, I just fell into that trap of just like, like checking, the, you know, checking out that I just, I was there and I was taking notes and doing all my stuff, but I wasn't. I, I wasn't invested in it anymore. So, um, but one thing that I think is really that I've learned from him as a teacher is this idea that you start, you start every endeavor with an intention. And if you're, if you're in a group like this group that we're in, it's, he says, it's very powerful. If you, if everyone states their intention um, in front of the group because there's kind of like a witness aspect to it and it makes it it makes it more strong and then um, and then at the end of the experience whatever the experience is everyone states a new intention of of how to proceed how to go forward with what they've learned which I think is very beautiful um, and again you know I started with a wonderful intention the first day and then yesterday <laughs> um, in the checkout, I, I, again, I couldn't turn my camera on, I couldn't say anything. And I know he knew I was like still missing from the group because he was keeping track of everyone's intentions. And he waited a long time even and said, um, he said, he said, it, it's okay if people want to pass, but is there anyone else who would like to stay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I couldn't do it. So, um, but but I, yeah, no, I learned a lot, but I, I it's, it's just, it was, it was very fraught for me. And I, and maybe it's just cause I, you know, under the surface, I was so anxious about this voice series and thinking, you know, Beatrice was on my case the whole time. Mama, you have something to do. <laughs> um, so, but thanks for asking that. Yeah, it's, it's um, a lot of the things I learned were really profound. So, um, 
yeah, I mean, Monio was the one that seemed interested in that, but uh, there were a lot of skills. He's a, apparently quite well known as a um, person who teaches conflict resolution. He's involved with a lot of social activist groups and things. But, um, but the, yeah, I feel like I talked way too much. Just don't, don't embarrass me. <laughs> I've had too much of it. Victoria, you are talking too much. <laughs> Get out. And then we can take over this idea of the intention, what, what, uh, what we are going to take out of it for the next two weeks. That's what I wanted to say, yeah. Okay, do you want to start? Maybe a short silence just to... Yeah, in, in this realm, for me, there is um, this, when is it just okay to retract and say, okay, let that <laughs> heal for itself and not just stirring it over and over and over again? And when is it something that you mentioned, like um, actually increasing the conflict? And I'm just in, in, I thought I was in the fur, <laughs> first part, but uh, maybe I'm in the latter. So I, I will have a look what that is. Yeah, so that's for the topic. That's my intention. And thank you, ladies. Interesting conversation and Victoria for bringing it up. Justine, you're unmuted. Um, I, I think I'll set an intention to look at uh, conflict in my life, inner and outer, and see what um, I discover, um, I don't think I have a lot of outer conflict, but probably more inner conflict, you know, some of those blue value rules that, uh, I grew up with, the, all that blue stuff, um, still creates a certain amount of inner conflict for me. So I will, um, I'll think about that and see which one I focus on and which one I want to work on. So thank you, Victoria, for sharing about your, your retreat. <laughs> I went at this, this last part of the conversation, I was thinking about conflict resolution, conflict avoidance about external conflict, outer conflict, but I think it's inner conflict is something. Yeah. <laughs> I avoid inner conflict a lot. Um, and the perceived conflict does become larger um, as a result. Um, so I think that's something I also want to think about more. But the other thing that I think I want to take forward is grounding within chaos. And, and and where where can that grounding and peace and relaxation come in at, at any point, at all points, in the chaos and the order? Um, so those are my two takeaways. Yeah, my takeaway is actually, um, I think Martini expressed it best. So thank you, Martini. Um, this idea of just being being with what is and doing what comes what needs to be done at this moment and and um i think um if to me that that covers all 
all the subjects of today, the, um, in terms of conflict that you, you simply be in the moment and do what needs to be done. And that will release the sense of conflict because it's clear like her flower that needed the water was more important at that moment than the paintbrush being washed out. Um, and that's really important for me to learn and to, to, to accept that order and chaos can coexist because I, all my life I've had the excuse that I'm not going to do what I really want to do until I've cleaned my room or until I've washed the dishes or until I've done the laundry. And then I don't do the things. And then my life goes by and it, I look back at my life and all I did was do the dishes and clean the counters and wash the clothes, you know? So I think it's a really important lesson. And um, yeah, so I, I think it's that idea of acceptance. And so that, solves the conflicts and the order and chaos all in one fell swoop. So thank you, Martini. And thank you, everybody. It was great. I had a beautiful experience. We didn't um, wash our windows for maybe two or three years. So when the sun was shining, the, the uh, windows were white of dust, white. So and my husband organized a man who is uh, washing the windows. He came and I thought, oh, this will be very complex and things like that. Oh no, he did just wash all the windows and not the wood or the, um, uh, the fenster bunk, um, not the wood around it or things like that, yeah? just the windows. But it is so shiny. It is so beautiful. And, and so <laughs> it also looks some, uh, up at some places that I said, oh, you have forgotten this. No, no, no. He said, that is the, the dirt is already grown into the window. I said, oh. <laughs> I, I think um, I, if I go over it, it will be cleaner, but it doesn't matter. I was so pleased that I was helped. And as, as we have to let us help as well for the disorder we have. And this is a very beautiful thing. And I, have a, I had a mother day with clean windows. <laughs> And by the way, um, we have had a project where our daughter is coming into the neighborhood of where we are living. And uh, today we got a yes. And so I'm very, very pleased that this is possible. And uh, I can feel for you, Christine, for Victoria, for Gertrude, I don't know if you have your um, children in the air, in the uh, air, good. We have a son in uh, the, close to us, but there is a little bit of a problem. How's <laughs> the smell? So um, it is as it is, you know, uh, and I don't worry about things anymore. I'm too old <laughs> to <laughs> but that is a, a really beautiful thing that does recently the most important thing happened by themselves. And um, uh, Richard Troar is giving so beautiful in, um, meditations. And uh, yeah, I think, and you are so beautiful. You are in front of me. And, and, and I, I do think I have the most important people in front of me. So I'm just very, very happy. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Martini. You give always this heartfelt uh, allegro note to the, to the music. <laughs> That's nice, yeah. What I take away, I think mainly this self-compassion thing, you know, to, to go deeper, because I feel that I can have a lot of compassion with, um, with humans, the human condition. 
you know, but sometimes I forget that I'm also human. <laughs> So I, I will think about that a little bit more. And then I will see you in two weeks. And if somebody wants to 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 present or guide some session, or I don't know, we will see. Otherwise, we, we talk like we did today. Okay. Have a nice time, everybody. Bye-bye.